everyone. In this tutorial, I'm going to run you through the time lapse version of a portrait I did of two Bernese mountain dogs. Now, this was done in pastels, and as always, once I've done my background, I will always start off with the eyes on any subject. There are a couple of main aims that I have when drawing the eyes on any animal. The first is, of course, the contrast, so I want to make sure that the eyelid at the top is nice and dark, and then if there's a bright reflection in the top of the eye itself, then I want to make sure that I've got that as bright as what is required. After that, I want to make sure I've got the 3D sphere shape of the eye, and that's all in where you put your shadows. Most of the time, you will have a shadow at the top part, just either side of the highlight or above the eye light in some light sources, and then there'll be a very subtle shadow at the bottom of the eye as well. When I then worked on this portrait, I just started then mapping in the fur around the eye. This is normally the process that I will follow on any portrait and I break it up into these small sections so that it becomes more manageable. I have a few videos here on YouTube really focusing on black fur, shiny fur, my top tips for drawing fur, all of those I will link in the description below. But my main aim here when I was working on the black fur is my contrast. I had to make sure that this fur was dark enough at the base layer stage so that it didn't end up looking like grey fur. Now that's something that can happen because we are frightened to go too dark in case we can't then brighten it back up. The real benefit here with pastels working on pastel mat when you are layering in this way is that as long as you don't feel the tooth of the paper, you can make adjustments like that. It's far better to go darker and have good contrast, being able to build up those layers working from dark to light than it is going, you know, playing it a little bit safe, going down more with a darker grey instead. And then you find it at the end that you don't feel like you've got the sharp contrast that you can see in that reference photo. We really must make sure that this black fur looks black. You'll notice here that I've used a few blues within that base layer so that I can really enhance and get a bit more of a richer black in that very first layer. Then it's going to provide even more depth within that fur so that then when the portrait is finished, everything has more of a three-dimensional feel. Black fur is very reflective, so depending on the light source and the white balance of that reference photo, you will be in some areas required to use blues and purples to really add that extra depth and feel to that fur. Now, colour selection is something that I talk a lot about on my slower real-time tutorials on Patreon. Colour mixing, how to, you know, picking the colours can be very stressful, but it doesn't have to be. The way that I select my colours is purely down to whether or not it is a warm colour or a cool colour, depending on where that sits on the colour wheel. If you've got a reference photo that does contain more warmer colours, you're likely going to have to be using more of the purple end of the colour wheel. If you've got more of the cooler values there, then you're going to be required to use more blues. This is where an eyedropper tool can come in handy and really be useful to then create colour swatches on any free apps or a computer software where you can edit those photographs, drag out some of those colours so that you can just specifically focus on that one colour. That can be really beneficial, especially at this base layer stage. And as we go through this here, you'll notice that once I do my base layer with my uh, pan pastels or my sanded soft pastel sticks, I will then always do a first layer of refinement on top before I start adding in my details. I think this is really important for many reasons, all of which I go in depth with in the Patreon versions. And if those slower tutorials in pastels and acrylics are of interest, I will link that in the description below as well. And I have made one of the dedicated videos on Patreon showing you how to create these colour swatches along with how to design your layouts for your pet portraits, how you can incorporate other backgrounds, you can get a feel for what that's going to look like before you actually make any changes or that desired background on that artwork. The reason why I think that's really important and to design that on a computer first is because then you're saving so much time in the actual drawing process. There might be instances where you think, oh, I'd really like a bluebell background with this subject, but it's not until you look at it and visualise with it on a computer that you think, actually, it doesn't quite work and I might need to do something else. So that's why I decided to make a dedicated tutorial on that as well, and I did combine the two. So as I've mentioned, if that's of interest, my Patreon is in the description below. So now that I'm starting to get about 80-90% of the top part of the face done, you can really see how many layers I'm putting in here. If I just work with two or three layers, I'm not going to have nowhere near the right amount of depth. Here I'm working with 10 to 12 layers and I'm building up gradually. If you jump in adding your brightest highlights too early on and you don't have the depth underneath, the portrait and the fur is just not going to look as realistic. 
The fur of Bernie's mountain dogs is very thick. I want to make sure that I replicated that texture in my portrait. Now, this is something that, again, I focus really in depth with the slower tutorials. I mention how to use that pencil, how to hold it, whether or not you need to drag it from left to right or right to left, depending on the type of fur stroke that we're trying to create. Even things down to how sharp that pencil needs to be. In some cases, I'm deliberately working with a blunt pencil for that type of fur texture that I'm trying to create. Another element when drawing fur that's really important and here is a prime example is the fur direction, the fur length and the fur thickness. You'll notice here that the short strands of fur between the eyes are shorter than the fur on the top of the head. They might only be by two or three millimetres but it, there is a variation there. I want to make sure that I've noticed and captured all of these changes in my portrait so that I really can get as much realism in the end result as I can. It's very tempting when we've been working on one area for a length of time to then do that same type of pencil stroke all over. The issue with that is the fur will look very two-dimensional. So just focus on the one part of the reference photo that you're looking at at that one time. And then every so often, I do recommend zooming out of that reference photo, looking at the image as a whole, and then making the alterations with lengthening or shortening your pencil strokes. It is easier to then judge that when you're looking at something as the entire image because sometimes when we've been zoomed into one section for any length of time we start to forget the areas that we've been working on and then accidentally without even realising lengthening our pencil strokes. And of course what then happens is the fur on the bridge of the nose for instance starts to look as long as the fur on the rest of the face which really isn't the case. Of course, that's going to be dependent on the breed that we're working from, but something like this you will naturally have on Bernie's Mountain Dogs or Springer Spaniels, those kinds of breeds. The fur on the top of the bridge of the nose is going to be significantly shorter than anywhere else on the face. And now that more of this portrait is coming together, it's really highlighting why I like to work in small sections. This was quite a big portrait, so I wanted to make sure that I was never left at that ugly stage for too long. And what that is, is those very first few initial layers where it has to go through that building process before it can start to look anywhere like that reference photo. If I left this portrait at this stage when I just worked on the top section of the head, I know then that it already looks like this dog. I can then feel far more motivated the following day to pick up my pencils again and carry on with it. And I know that if I was to be working with individual layers, so I'd do my first base layer all over, then my second layer on top, and then start to do my details, I don't think I'd work as effectively as I do when I follow these small sections. So if you're finding that you're getting overwhelmed by the portrait, or alternatively that you've got lots of work that's unfinished, both of those things can be caused by just taking on too much of a large area narrow it down focus on one element at a time and it usually then makes the entire drawing process much easier so one main element that i had to make sure that i got right here is that the white fur and the white marking above the nose was really nice and clean i didn't want there to be any mudding up of these layers at all and that can happen very easily when you've got a white marking that's up against black fur now i do have a cat video on patreon and it's predominantly all in real time and it is of a black and white cat where the markings meet up just like they do here and i go in depth there because it's in real time showing you how you can do both of these fur colors and avoid muddying up of the layers what i wouldn't want here is to drag some of that black pigment into the white and end up with a gray looking patch and depending on the white fur that i am drawing i will sometimes go down with a mid-tone gray and a slightly darker base layer and then build up my white details from there or if it's particularly bright i will put the lightest pan pastel down first and then add in my shadow separately now as i say this is going to vary depending on the reference photo and the type of fur that i am trying to recreate it really is gonna be subjective to each individual portrait but fundamentally the techniques may vary from dark to light or light to dark. So when I'm drawing tongues, in some cases you'll notice that I will use a soft pastel stick and directly apply that to my paper. Now this is something that I don't do very often because it can be easy to fill the tooth of the paper which will limit how many layers you can add on top. 
But because I only use the light fast pastel pencils, I'm a little bit limited with the pinks that I have there. So in these cases, I do put the soft pastel sticks down first. And just like the fur, I'm really focusing on my contrast. Notice how I'm starting to get my cooler purples and blues in there. And then the end of the tongue itself is more of those reds and pinks. This is really helping following with that light source because of course the tongue at the back section is not able to get the same amount of light as the end part of the tongue. That's going to be in shadow. I really want to make sure that I've indicated that at my drawing. And because tongues are wet, they're going to be very reflective. So you want to make sure that if you see any bright white highlights that you add those in and that any part of the gum area, if they are particularly dark black, that you get those as dark as you possibly can. One big tip when you are working on the gum area, as I am here, really follow the way that the curved and the, the highlights and the shadows are forming. If we make these too straight or they're not traveling in the right direction, we will change the shape of the mouth and it will start to make the whole portrait look a little off. So these details are important. You want to make sure that you've got those accurate to that reference photo. And of course, because this dog is smiling, he's panting a little bit here, it's causing the creases either side of his mouth. I have to make sure that I've got those as dark and then I'm building up the details in the right place in order to get the entire shape of the face right. If the creases are not high enough or they've been made too narrow, for instance, again, these are things that are going to change the shape of the face. The portrait at the end won't resemble as much like this pet as it should. These are the types of details that are really important when we're working on pet portraits. So as I start working down towards the lower section of the portrait, I'm going to start to tackle the longer, thicker, more denser fur around the neck. This is one of the more challenging parts of this portrait because of how the fur is clumped together. There's a lot of the white fur that overlaps the black and it is clumped together with some of those finer details spread apart. So this is one of those instances where you only want to be focusing at one layer at a time, ignoring everything else on top. And I do have a video on Patreon focusing on how to overlap white clumped fur like this, the longer fur, over the top of the black. So as always, like with fur with the face, I want to make sure here that I've got a really nice good base foundation. That's really important. There is no good me focusing on adding those white fur details over the top at this stage if I don't have what's drawn in behind it first. Now the wonderful thing with pastels is that we can layer our lights over darks. However, what you'll notice is I'm focusing on my darker areas to the left and then as I work my way round, I'm going to start to map in some of the additional shapes. What this is doing is it's actually breaking up this one section of the portrait so that it's not becoming too overwhelming. And this is something that I will do in any part of my own work. I will work on a left section and then a bit on the right. Then it may, really does narrow down the space in the middle and it does become easier to tackle. I've mapped in my general shapes with a lighter white colour. It's, it's not pure white. It's got a little bit of a grey colour mixed in with it. But it is really showing the main clumps of fur. Once I've got those in place, as you can see here, I'm starting to map in the fur around it. I want to make any part of what I'm drawing as simple as I can. If I start to overthink the entire process, which is very easy to do, we actually start to make layering decisions and put far too much stress on ourselves. And it actually does not only make us take longer on that portrait, but we start to stare at the reference photo thinking, what bit should I work on next? And that is really because we start to overthink the whole thing break it down into small sections and then individual layers just as I am here and look at it as abstract shapes. Something that can really help is if you turn your artwork and the reference photo upside down, your brain then won't be thinking of drawing fur as such. It will just be focusing on the shapes that it can see in front of you. And a big tip when you are drawing fur like this, if you think you can see a white section of the fur but it looks like it is on top of the black fur, leave that until you've got the black fur in first. It is really important because we don't want it to look like it's two-dimensional. We want it to look like the white fur in this instance should be sitting on the very top. You can then add the darker shadows on top just as I am doing here if you feel like it's got some of that black showing through and creating more of like a darker grey area. Then as you can see here, you can add your details on top very easily. As long as you haven't filled the tooth of the paper early on, you really can layer your white details back over the top. But as you can see here, this is only looking realistic because I've got my darker base layers down first. 
Whatever I could see that was behind it went in and then I focused on the details that overlapped. And in a couple of seconds, you're going to see the finished portrait and then I will upload the second Bernese Mounted Dog that you can see in this portrait for another video here on YouTube. And I hope the tips and techniques that I've shared in this video are useful. If you've got any questions, anything art related, pop them in the comments below. I'm more than happy to help if I can. If this video was useful, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube at the weekend and the slower tutorials and all of the additional ones that I've got here on YouTube that I've referenced are going to be in the description below. So as always, thank you so much for watching.